so um for now if um you guys want to mute yourselves and then um you can just uh post in the chat if there's anything that you want to ask or if you want to introduce your businesses obviously we'll provide a, a section at the end for you to ask questions as well um so it's, you've got myself today rachel and also ollie as well Hi, everyone. who's going to be doing a section of the presentation and this one is all for the aimed at the businesses basically that are visitor economy so the tourism base you know the events the the attractions you know all of those kinds of, of businesses but i've no doubt that there'll be things that will be beneficial if that's not your your core type of business as well things that you can learn so that's totally totally fine for you to, to stay and enjoy it as well so we are in series two still, and we are on our second to last one. So then we'll be handing over for series three to back to Freedom Works for that. Um, so we've got today's session, and then we've got one next Tuesday, which is a panel event and mm. lots of opportunity for you to ask questions and to network as well. Um, digital champions. So we've got a few with us today. This is a brilliant offering where you can actually get eight hours of free support following your attendance at these webinars. So if there's something that you think that you would like help with to adapt technology, it might be, you know, training your team up. Um, it might be learning how to use a CRM or help with e-commerce, whatever it is, then please do get in touch with Coast to Capital. You can go onto their website or drop them an email to that email address there, which is growth.hub at coast2capital.org.uk. And you don't have to choose who you want to work with in advance. They will help assign the right person to, to you. So, you know, if it is marketing staff, you're quite likely to get me. Um, but there are other people as well on the team and they've all got different skill sets. So, yeah, make sure that you don't miss that opportunity. So to begin with, I'm just going to run a quick poll to find out. Oh, hang on. My poll's not working. Ollie, can you run the poll? Yeah, and right, um, we'll fail. <laughs> what's your word? So visitor economy. Let's relaunch the poll. Right, it should be there now. Can, we, can everyone see that? Should be able to double click on, on um, the answer that suits you best, which is how confident are you in marketing your visitor economy business? Um, or if it's not visitor economy, just your business in general. Um, let's see. Can, yeah, I can can't everyone... see the poll. Can everyone else? Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Let's try this once more. Oh, that's... Are you getting answers, Ollie? Because I can't actually. I'm see not it. getting any answers actually. No, I can't see the poll. Technical difficulties. Hmm. Right. Let's uh, try once more. No poll. Okay, not going to be able to do that then. Okay, would you be able to, in that case, just to drop us a note in the chat and let us know how confident you are feeling about marketing your visitor economy business? Um, the first option we normally put is not at all confident. The second is somewhat confident. And then the third is confident. If you could just do that for us so that we can judge how much we've helped you <laughs> at the end, then that would be awesome. Thank you. Good work, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the next thing that I would love you to put in the chat is, can you tell us what kind of business you are, so where you sit within the, within that kind of economy, that, that sector, and why you're here today. You know, what can we help you with today? That would be really good to know. Thank you. Perfect. Few confidence, few not at all, few somewhat. So there's a nice, nice mix in here. Thanks. So, yep, just drop those notes in to say what you do, why you're here today. Okay, so, yeah, that's fine, Samantha. Yeah, there's loads of stuff that will still be valuable to you, Samantha, for sure, definitely. Water sports and ecology experiences, that sounds interesting. Mm, yeah. Okay. A little minute interpretation. Brilliant. Great. Thank you very much. Cool, so yeah. we will get started, I think. And if anyone else appears, we'll just let them in. Yeah. 
So the first thing that um, I'm going to say is if you haven't met me before, I'm Rachel from Shake It Up Creative. I run a marketing design company in Worthing and I've worked with various tourism and hospitality clients over the years, including restaurants, hotels, attractions and sports events. So hopefully today both Only and myself can share some insight into digital best practice for these kinds of businesses, but also give you some ideas for action to improve your sales as well. And we're going to start that journey with talking about planning. Now, for a tourism or visitor economy business, it's absolutely vital that you are running your own super advanced schedule. Now, why is this? Because you need to catch the early bird. So you need to catch those people that are planning ahead, those ones that are bargain hunters and looking to look at discounted prices, um, all of those that just simply don't want to miss out. And for visitor economy businesses in particular, marketing is often not about selling the tangible, it's about telling a story and selling an experience that taps into an emotion and also connects with your audience. National print media, their Christmas deadlines are really early and they usually fall in August, believe it or not. So all those companies that are looking to get a product in those features that are talking about, you know, the must have Christmas gifts for the year, um, the, the must have attend events for the year, you know, those are normally pitched in to the media companies around summertime. So you really have to be super ready for that. 40%, 47% of consumers actually start thinking about buying Christmas gifts for their friends and family before November. So again, we can't be reliant on when, when the shops start putting out everything, when the Christmas music comes on, we need to get really organized for that. Um, now in a Facebook ad survey, this actually showed that the largest sales come in October time and ads are costing a whole load more at the end of November where the, the highest ad spend is occurring at that time. But you might also want to take advantage of some super sales events that we now have. Over here in the UK, we've, we've kind of adopted the Black Friday and the Cyber Monday from, from the States. That happens at the end of November and it gives you a good reason or a good, another excuse to put a sale on or to actually have an offer and sell the, the services or the, you know, the event tickets or whatever it is that you're promoting as a tourism business. Tourism and events marketing is more customer centric really than any other type of industry marketing. People will spend thousands of pounds to travel and to have a good time. So if businesses can't meet their customers' expectations, they're actually risking poor reviews, poor word of mouth, and they become unable to retain repeat business. So answering questions in your event marketing can actually convert insecure users into booked customers. You're aiming for a conversion and you want to be preempting concerns and detailed questions so that you can help speed up the booking decision for these people. Now these things can all, all be done through things like social media posts, articles, video, PR and all the usual types of marketing activities. But overall, the highly effective marketing plans for tourism related businesses will show a clear understanding of the characteristics and the motivations and the behaviors and the experience of each and every customer. The marketing needs to show people how they can temporarily escape their normal, their, their hectic, hectic lives and actually change um, venue and, and go for some entertainment and show them that they will make memories by coming to, to your business. Now, as we've seen, and we'll hear more on later, the tourism industry is more vulnerable than any other industry. Fluctuations in seasons, uh, also in consumer demand, unforeseen circumstances such as natural disasters, employment strikes, local conflicts, oh, and uh, a little global pandemic can all jump out of a hedge and, and make you suffer. Now, Eventbrite data has proven that a third of event capacity actually sells in the early bird period for events that they list. So that proves that early is key. Now, the ultimate goal of an organization in the tourism industry is to exceed the expectations of the tourist. For everything you do, you want to be building brand awareness the whole year round, and you need to be planning, 
executing your marketing tactics, tracking what works, measuring it, and then repeating it, perhaps with some adjustments if necessary. Now, customers have varying wants and requirements, of course, but all of them need the basics, which are convenience, excellent service, value, and quality. Because visitor businesses are largely based on experience, the target market audiences utilize their sight, their sound, their touch, and their taste to judge the event or adventure. And what I'm saying here is that delighting potential customers, so injecting some fun and creating inviting marketing really sets the right tone and will establish expectations. You've probably all seen QR codes or used one or one time or another. Their popularity was wavering, but because of their no touch feature, they've made a bit of a comeback. Um, it obviously limits contact between people. So QR codes have been favored recently and used much, much more by businesses um, lately. They work really well, and not just to move people from offline to online situations, like scanning a code at a historical site, for example, to get more information, but also once a customer is inside your destination. So an example of that might be um, a villa company that has been placing one inside each of their villa rentals that can be scanned, and then that allows the customer to actually see similar villas in other destinations. So what they're doing is they're already thinking about getting bookings from that customer for a different holiday the following year, or in years to come, of course. In ads where you've got limited space, you can use a QR code to bring people to a landing page for more information, or maybe to enter an online competition. It's really important to note though, that if you use a free QR generator, which is totally fine and is low to online, ensure that it has got tracking capability. Some of them don't. And you want to create an account to be able to use it. Otherwise, you're just gonna never know how many people have actually scanned the code and come to your site and taken the action that you wanted. Now, some codes can look really cool. There's an example here where it allows color and imagery customization. So you can create your QR codes in brand colors like this one, or even some of them have like shape in the middle of it. I've seen some with like a little dinosaur and things like that to make them really much more interesting. So customized QR codes, they, they are totally possible. You also want to ensure that your desti destination page is mobile optimized. Now, it sounds like it's something that's a bit obvious, but you'd be surprised how many businesses set up a QR code and then perhaps they're falling behind in the way that their, their mobile pages are being presented and it really affects the user experience. So please ensure that if you're going to use these, the destination that you're taking people to is fully mobile optimized and is a good website experience for your customer. Now, there's just a bit of a graph here to show you where, um, where QR codes are basically scanned the most. Um, this was data developed by Mobile Iron, and it found that eateries, so places like restaurants, bars, and cafes, but also retail shops or locations, and on consumer packaging as well, they were the most frequently scanned types of locations for QR codes last year. So I'd imagine that we've all seen them now in restaurants post-COVID. Sometimes that is for menu access at the very least. Sometimes it's for ordering too, for the whole experience. Obviously, you need to place your code in scannable locations. So we're not talking about dark subways or high up, unable to reach billboards here. You need to also make it clear what people are scanning for. What are they going to get when, when they scan your QR code? Moving on to talk about user experience, which I just touched on, I wanted to show you an example from Tully. So they're up near Crawley. Um, they have some very well known now uh, seasonal events. Christmas is one of those. At the moment, they're doing their pumpkin picking event. And they also have a massive Halloween event as well, Shoptober. Um, they've adopted digital over the years and have done that very well. But this is just an example of the, of the landing page, really. So 
I just want to point out a few things. So the call to action on this page is highlighted. If you're looking at that menu at the top, they've got the different sections. Most of them are in white, but you've got that one in gold there, which is the one that ideally they want people to take. They want people to click and actually buy and book their tickets right now. But that menu is also, it's become more of an essentials menu. So they're not including everything under the sun and they're not talking about other events that they run, but they're actually promoting the essential information that people need in categories in that menu. They've made the video optional. So people are landing on that page and getting blasted with it with an also running video there. If people want to watch the video and get a, a sample for the experience they're gonna have, then they put the option to do that. They also have a countdown. And that really just accentuates the urgency. You know, how many sleeps is it till Christmas? Do we need to get these kinds of things booked for the kids? Um, trying to encourage people to take that action there and then when they're on the site. They've got some additional relevant information down the bottom, but again, it's very focused just on this event. And then when once you get past this, I did check it out. You can have they've got a very simple checkout. So they're not asking for information that they don't need. It's quick and easy to complete. It shows you all of the available slots and dates that you can book for. And people can be processed pretty quickly and end up with their tickets in an, in an easy way. So why are landing pages really important? Well, a landing page it is just a web page, but it serves as the entry point for a website or a particular section of a website. It can also be a standalone page, which is deliberately created to help convert visitors. So examples might be a competition landing page, uh, maybe service pages, or a page for visitors from a specific place. So an example of that is, um, for my site, I've got a Twitter landing page. If you notice from our analytics that we were getting a lot of people clicking through from Twitter. So we decided to, I guess, personalize that a little bit and give them a page which says, you know, thanks for finding us on Twitter and coming to visit us here. And it directs, directs them to different sections of the site. So you can do similar things to that. It doesn't have to be something that you're booking or making a purchase on. And when a landing page needs to make an action happen, so a sign up or a purchase, for example, it's really important that you don't distract the visitor. So you've got to reduce or eliminate menus and links to other pages, and you need to reinforce the action down the page because you want the visitor to take that action as they progress. So you'll see on this example here from Universal that you know they've got the buy now and they've got the buy tickets as well down the bottom. So as people get down the page, there's another opportunity to take that action that they want them to do. Now, obviously the user journey, you, if you've got people as far as getting to your checkout, brilliant, but you don't want to lose them then you can actually boost your checkout completion rate by five or even 10%, um, you will make a significant difference to your return on investment. So extra costs like high shipping fees was actually the number one reason that online shopping carts get abandoned. And that was found during some research just this year. And a sudden stock depletion is a massive frustration. So you want to ensure that it's clear on your product pages at an earlier stage if you've got a very limited number of tickets or products available so that you're avoiding that disappointment. If people know that there's only one of something left, by the time they get to their checkout, if they're taking a while to complete it and that's gone, they don't feel so much blame for you. You know, they were aware that there was only one left, they've got to be quick to nab it and perhaps it just wasn't working for them on that occasion, and they'll be better luck next time. But clarity and ease is what you want. So even removing the footer and additional navigation can help reduce the distractions at the checkout stage as well. And if you're providing autocomplete facilities for addresses, that really helps, but only if it's a good one. Some of them are a bit frustrating. I've noticed several times um, when I've been buying on different sites that I've had autocomplete available to me and it's said, yep, it's got your card details. And then despite the fingerprint approval, the card details haven't quite stayed complete 
and yet still have to be entered manually. And that's really annoying for a customer. So make sure that you're implementing something that's reliable, it works well, but also get people to test it out. Don't forget to keep the back button. It sounds a bit strange, but when people make mistakes and they want to go and correct their details or they want to make additions, you know, perhaps they even want to increase uh, the number of tickets that they're buying, for example, you've got to make that easy for people. If you click back and they completely get jumped out of the site, again, they might not bother coming back to make that booking. You can also reinforce trust at the checkout. So things like including the padlock symbol, um, reviews and customer testimonials, the credit card symbols, and also high product rating scores will build the trust of the customer and encourage them to take that step and hit buy. Make sure that you always send order confirmation emails and include the contact details for any issues as well. It's very frustrating for a customer when they can't get a hold of somebody or they don't know how to actually reach the customer service team. So now Ollie is going to talk to you about data capture. So I'm just going to let him take over the screen share and I'll be back after that. Thanks very much, Rachel. Right, can everyone see my screen okay? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, data. So um, I'm Ollie from Creative Bloom. So you may have um, seen me run the uh, search marketing course uh, a few weeks ago, uh, but at Creative Bloom, we are all about data. Stu and I like to say that data doesn't lie. Um, so obviously if you can make a lot of your marketing decisions or decisions in general um, backed and influenced by data, you're essentially going to be um, not just trusting your gut like this um this dinosaur over here you're actually going to be going for, with you know looking at what your customers are doing on your website in your stores um and at all different points along the um user journey and uh and kind of taking that data and using it to kind of um, become more efficient etc so we're looking at facts and statistics that are collected together for reference um or analysis um, and it's going to essentially give us a much more targeted approach, right, if we use data. So um, especially when you're, you know, um, if you're starting your business from scratch, from brand new, you know, you don't have much data to go on and you are going by your best understanding from research, what you know about your business. But over time, it's really important as soon as we start getting people through our website, as soon as we start getting people to our um, stores, um, what types of data can we collect to either qualify what we already know? Um, or change, make some changes um, that will um, increase uh, sales, increase our customers' uh, satisfaction, um, et cetera. And we always say that the earlier you can start collecting it, the better, okay? So you could have, you know, a thousand, you know, an email list with 10,000 emails in it. But if you haven't done any work to really um, look at the data about your customers, um, which emails they're opening, which they're not, which products they're interested in buying, um, then you're likely probably just sending some generic emails out to that whole email list. It's much better um, in the long run to really try and refine your list down, start to segment your um, customers already into groups so that when you're eventually marketing to them, you're sending them relevant um, products and information that you know they're interested in from the data that you've, um, that you've discovered. So it's all about kind of nurturing your customers, nurturing your email list, nurturing um, the data that you've already got. And by you know looking at the data, we can actually answer a lot of questions that um, that at Creative Bloom we get asked all the time. So why do people leave um, the basket? Why didn't people um, check out? Um, how did this customer find us? You know, you can use something like Google Analytics. Um, why did the customer book with us loads last year, but they haven't booked at all this year? You know, so looking, you know, comparing um, yourself to your competitors and looking at how the data's changed there. Um, you know, how are um, you know, refer a friend schemes working for you and uh, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's loads of questions that we can essentially ask. Um, and in effect, once we start kind of taking some actions, we're going to improve all sorts of different areas um, of uh, the site and of the customer's experience. So, you know, regarding customer journeys, um, efficiency, you know, even if you're paying for tools at the beginning that cost a little bit more, in the long run, you're probably going to be reducing your costs because you're going to be spending less time um, you know, just aimlessly throwing out a big net and trying to catch 
just any fish that you can catch in it rather than actually be really targeted you know with a with a fishing pole and selecting exactly the customer you're trying to target um, and as i said the whole aim once we've learned from this data is to send targeted personalized and relevant information and products um, to our customers or to attract them into into the store obviously if it's a if it's a physical um, location that you're that we're talking about so let's use an example um, the uh, visitor economy that has loads of data points so loads of opportunities where we can um, collate a lot of data so a hotel for example boutique hotel in brighton let's imagine from the top um so from the top up here where it says search keywords to the bottom that is the so the top is where the user found us so the customer typed something into google potentially or maybe they typed it into a into a um, directory third party platform that kind of thing but as they go through this stage through our website from when they they're looking for our website from when they're on our site looking through it typing in the search bar um, to the pages they're visiting you know maybe they're putting a few different uh, hotel rooms in their cart and debating which one's uh, going to make the most sense. They might fill out a contact form. Um, and even after that process, once they're at location, you know, even when they're calling down to, to uh, the hotel lobby and asking for room service requests, that's all data that we can actually capture. And if you can start to understand, OK, this individual customer, you know, they've come to our hotel. I know that they like a bottle of wine when we arrive. I know that they like you know, to have breakfast in their room and not on, you know, all of these things immediately make such a better experience for the user and for the customer. Um, if you could start using this to better, you know, improve your marketing and that kind of thing. Um, so that later on, you know, after you've looked at, you know, which room did they book? How much did they pay for it? Um, do they have any special requests and that kind of thing? You can then um, offer them an email or send them a targeted email um, that, for example, might offer them um, a room upgrade because we've looked at that user's journey and what they actually did was they put the C, C room in their checkout um, but they ended up booking a cheaper room and so what we could do is we could think okay well we could possibly offer them this upgrade um, at a quieter period when we know we don't get as many bookings um, but you know we can show them a picture of the room that they didn't book um, but it's all these things that kind of remind the user of, of maybe what they wanted, we're very aware of it. Um, we could offer a complimentary bottle of whatever they are, whatever they had before and they had to pay for. So, but we're actually using the data that we've looked at to, you know, when we're trying to send out some emails to our uh, email lists for the people who visited our hotel before, we're actually sending them much more personalized things that they're likely going to be much more likely to, um, uh, to respond well to, you know, and then once they've uh, received those emails, we're gonna check uh, the click-through rates, open rates, and all that kind of thing. So we're never stopping. We're constantly reviewing the data and seeing what's going on. And the key steps for successful um, data capture uh, are going to be first deciding what data you should be capturing, right? Because there are so many different things that we could be looking at. And let's be honest, it's not all going to be relevant for everyone. It's all always going to be different. Um, and also, you know, if there's just one of you in the business, um, which isn't uncommon, you know, it's about your time as well. How much time do you have to look into this? You know, it's about identifying which is going to be the most valuable for you um, and, you, you know, positively influence and affect your marketing best. Um, so deciding what data you should be capturing, creating a data capture process. And essentially all we're saying there is just working out at which points we're going to be um, collecting that data and then you know how we're going to be storing that data um, and then using it in future um, a huge uh, really important rule is simplicity keeping things simple um, which is a lot of um, reasons why people go to move into things like what we're going to talk about in a second which is like a crm system essentially just a dashboard where we can see this really easily and really straightforward and, and we can search for you know customer groups um, and we, we can really easily segment our customers using this thing. So keep it really simple so we're not kind of scratching our heads too much and getting lost in, in uh, the sea that can sometimes be a big spreadsheet or that kind of thing. Um, and of course, security. So we had a GDPR um, workshop the other day uh, that was really fantastic. But security, making sure you keep people's data um, safe is, is going to be really important as well. 
So firstly, what we talk about um, or how I'm deciding to um, organize it is we're going to call it uh, primary data, which is the data such as uh, things like uh, GDPR personal data when someone's filling out a form um, and the stuff that um, people aren't likely to change. So it's like the device that they're using to browse the website and uh, you know what network they're on, their screen size, that kind of thing, if you know what mobile they're using. But that, those kind of things, you know, GDPR is obviously, GDPR personal data is, you know, stuff around their name, you know, maybe the uh, clothing size they're, they're regularly buying, those kind of things we're probably likely to keep in this, in this box. And that's whether uh, we need to make sure we're super secure on it um, and adhering to all the rules regarding that. But then we have the secondary data. And this is the stuff that we're likely, um, you know, when we start our business, we don't have this information yet. We don't know how people are browsing the website. And this is where over time, when we're looking at each stage, you know, so here we've got, you know, different stages of the user journey from awareness to purchase, to if someone's returning products, um, to, you know, loyalty and advocacy and that kind of thing. Again, at each individual stage along here, we can be collecting information on how um, the user is browsing the website, the products they're interested in. And we can start kind of um, using systems uh, which we'll talk about in a second to start to get some stats around how our um you know uh, our stores are performing how happy our customers are and what we can do to kind of improve these things and just in a similar a slightly more easy to read um table we've got areas that we can collect data website analytics so that's stuff like google analytics which we which Stu ran our course on the other day um social media of course there's loads of things around engagement um, how many people who are viewing us on social media are actually coming in store? Um, you've got tracking pixels, which I think um, Rachel's going to talk about in a little bit. Contact information, feedback and sur surveys, um, customer service software, and obviously the transactions that people are making. So once you've selected, once you once you know the kind of data you want to capture, and you can be a little bit more aware of kind of um, okay, we want to track our customers. We need that GDPR um, data to be uh, to identify one customer from another. Um, we're then going to look to ideally capture it in what's called a CRM. So it's a customer relationship management tool. And the real reason that we do this is, is like we said before, to easily at, at a glance be able to see what's going on um, with our customer grouping. So where um, how, we, how, how, how happy are our customers? How many products did they buy? Which of our customers um, in this CRM system are, um, would we say are most engaged, which aren't very engaged and can we work out why? Um, but they should be easy to analyze. Um, the, ac the information should be really easy to access. And in a few slides, you know, we'll really be talking about how important this segmentation is. Um, and these CRM systems, there's there's a, just a few examples here, Monday CRM, HubSpot. Um, we do use HubSpot, but it's a much bigger tool. Um, but there's a lot, lot of options out there. So here's one that focuses much more on data analysis and purely just does that. But you can see all the different types of data sources that we're pulling in here. So funnel. Um, it's pulling in everything from Google Analytics, it's pulling in your AdWords data, it's pulling in social media, it's pulling in um, Stripe, so if you've got payment gateways on the website, and what it's going to do is it's going to link all those data sources, and then it's going to provide you with some information and in, in an easy to read way that you can start making some better decisions on. Um, uh, so Funnels one, and then you've got something like um, Pure 360, for example, which is, is almost like a do it all tool. So this is the, the CRM system, so where all the data is being stored, but as well as that, they'll offer marketing and they'll offer automation. You know, when we talk about automation, this is about taking the manual effort out of it and trying to use a little bit more of AI learning, um, so artificial intelligence, to actually um, send people the right emails. You know, if someone hasn't opened this, that's, it's gonna automatically send them this a few days later, um, or it's gonna only show them images of particular products that are related to the ones that we know they're interested in. So they can, these can get, you know, really quite in depth and, and really help your processes in the long run. And obviously the more and more data you have, the more and more customers you have, as soon as you have something like automation, 
um, and you have a computer helping you make sense of what's going on, um, it's really going to uh, make you able to keep on top of this, keep on top of your data. You know, it's all right when you've got maybe 100, 500 people in there, but once you start kind of building your businesses out, you're going to really want to um, uh, be able to make the most of these tools um, so that you can, while you build your business, keep improving your marketing, keep improving your uh, customer relationships, and that kind of thing. And my tip for you on uh, if you don't is everything out there is offering free trials. Um, and you know, if even if you're even if you're completely brand new to this, you could very easily learn a lot through taking advantage of all these free tar trials. You can essentially get a little bit of free consulting, um, consulting from these businesses. You can ask them to have a look at um, you know your website and what they suggest, what types of data you, they think you should capture. Um, so I would definitely recommend that. And there's a little link down here. You're going to get the slides um, as usual. They'll be they will be posted online. Um, but there's a link down here of um, a, a really good website that kind of shows you a, a broad range of lots of different um, uh, tools and software, all with reviews and that kind of thing. So let's have a look. However, of course, it's relevant to say that we don't all have necessarily the um, budget to be paying for these expensive tools if they are expensive and not, you know, um, I know there are some questions about the cost of these tools. It's not off the top of my head. I'm not aware of the cost of them off the top of my head. However, um, what's, what's really important is this is something you, that you can build towards and it's about knowing, being aware of what the possibilities are, right? And at the moment, there are free data collection tools that we can use at the moment, which do exist. Um, and, you know, although, of course, they're not going to be as interlinked as, as everything else that we're talking about, but what we need to be realistic and use what we have um, uh, to, to hand at the moment. So Google Analytics, we obviously know. I think the lot, in Stu's session the other day, almost everyone had Google Analytics, but almost, uh, almost no one used it which is very common. Yeah, we don't have time to kind of jump in there and dig around, but that is showing some really, really beneficial information about our website and the user journey and how people are experiencing it. So really valuable tool. Of course, um, the famous Excel um, that many of us stay away from, Stu loves it, but uh, it's a sp spreadsheet software. <laughs> um, it's kind of the bane of my life, Stu's colorful, crazy spreadsheets, but you know, that's, uh, that's the joy of data, there he is. And, um, you know, and then you look at other things, you know, you might already have MailChimp and, you know, you might be sending out emails, but again, it's quite common for us not to be checking open rates. You know, we're not, we're not necessarily checking who's opening, who's not managing those lists, you know, seeing, you know, doing some, you know, sending out different emails to different people to see how, how they're responding differently. This is all data we have available to us at the moment. And, um, it might already be free, be free to you. Um, you know, so like I said, Google Analytics, you've got something like a landing page, just, just grabbing one simple report as an example. This is the landing page report, which it just means the page that someone first lands on when they visit your website. Um, and you might find that the actual, the amount of um, conversions or sales that you're getting from one landing page over another could be vastly different. Um, and it's important to take a look at this data and, and, and kind of, um, you know, check if you're if you're doing the right thing, if you need to tweak it, if you need to review which page you're sending people to, and even if we look at something like a spreadsheet, you know, um, you know, you can do stuff to make it much easier to read. You know, so we're not using these complex um, um, but very handy paid-for tools. We're going to export something into a spreadsheet, but then we're going to use something like conditional formatting to just better view the data, um, so that at a glance anyone can quickly filter, you know, from um, which keywords have brought us the highest clicks. Uh, which keywords are most expensive if we wanted to run um, paid advertising um, and we can filter them. Um, so there are ways that we can learn how to better view our data and still be able to make informed decisions um, using these fruit free tools essentially. And like I said, once you've started to look at the data, you would you ideally want to start segmenting your customers. So you want to seg segment them into groups. Um, and the reason is, is because, you know, of course, if you have 100 people in your email database, they're not all necessarily going to be, um, you know, if you're a restaurant buying the same meal, 
So, you know, you might have some vegans in there, but you might serve burgers. Why would you want to send an email of a nice juicy beef burger to a, to a vegan if, you know, if, if um, we really know that they don't eat them? So it's about looking at the data and, and kind of trying to decide how can we segment these people and let's send them some emails and see what the engage, how the engagement differs if we, if we try to be a bit more targeted, a bit more personalized than just doing a, a, a one catch all approach with one big email to all these people. I know there's lots of questions going on, um, but I, so we, I will come to them hopefully at the end, just so you know, I know that um, Rachel and Stu are jumping in there, but. <laughs> because, you know, after we segment our customers, the truth is, is that the majority of us would actually much rather have personalized targeted emails showing us, um, I say emails, obviously, it could be anything, it could be paid advertising as well. But we'd much rather be seeing things that we're interested in than th that we wouldn't. So, you know, I, um, you know, Bloom and Wild, for example, there, there's a, you know, online um, a flower company, we can de deliver flowers to people through the letterbox. You know, I typically buy certain colours of flowers from there. You know, if they were to send me lots of emails with um, a colour that I wasn't really interested in, so bright red is typically a colour I don't like buying, I find it a little bit garish. So, um, you know, if they were to send me an email saying, you know, uh, here's a discount, here's a promotion off these flowers, it's just not any flowers I ever buy. Whereas obviously if they sent me a promotion with photos of things I do buy, it's gonna make me much more likely to, to engage or at least check it out. So um, it's gonna build trust, it's gonna keep it in my mind. Um, it's gonna increase advocacy. So telling people about it, refer a friend schemes are gonna improve. Um, so just by learning from the data, we're being more personalized, more targeted over time. I wanted to um, uh, give you a free uh, a tool, a little um, extra tip on a tool, you know, Hotjar. Um, feel free to write if you've heard of Hotjar or not, but it's a uh, user behavior visualization tool for a website. And it is free, It's it has a free option. I think it limits you to a certain number of um, uh, what, what, what they call recordings a month or heat maps. But essentially what it does, is it tells you um, and shows you in visual form where people are clicking on your website, where their mouse, like uh, where the mouse is moving, you know, on mobile, it shows where people are scrolling to. Um, and then it also records whole sessions for you. So people who are browsing on mobile and desktop from the, the point that they arrive to the point they leave, you can see where they're clicking on your website and the type of experience um, that they're having um, and that massively massively will influence you know um, uh, user experience and your understanding of how a customer browses your website so there's a little example there you can just see uh, um, this is a screen recording of someone's someone scrolling down a page uh, obviously it's just a just a brief example but you can imagine that if you can see where people are clicking where they're spending their time and attention um, it's going to make a big big difference you're actually using this data you know, this visual behavioral data to, to influence, you know, how you format your pages. So really in the end, it's just all about trying not to be, um, be a business that just chucks out a huge net to all the people you spent so long, you know, and such, so, so much work on, on crafting, um, you know, a, a really engaged customer base. Um, you know, it's about not chucking a net and just advertise, you know, sending them the same stuff. It's about trying to, uh, send out individual lines, have your customer groups, design a lure that's specific for that fish. Um, so Stu likes water-based analogies, so that's the only reason this is in here. But um, yeah, obviously you have a lure that attracts a specific fish. And uh, in the same way, you have an email that's going to attract a specific customer. Um, so learn from the data. Uh, use it as best you can and you know don't give yourself a hard time just do something that's at the moment makes sense to you and that is um you know plausible there are free ways to do it at the moment um so if that's where you're at then um yeah jump in and just have a look around that's what you're doing you can't do anything wrong okay i'm going to hand back to rachel uh, who's going to talk about uh remarketing i'll just stop sharing Great, thank you. And Oli, I love that you buy flowers regularly. That's it's true, it's true. Made me smile. <laughs> I just I just realized that I probably said it and then Stu's look thinking they're scratching his head, wondering why he hasn't received any, but <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. 
Yeah, so we're going to jump into a bit of um, a remarketing explanation. Um, people that have become really distracted um, often move on to the next thing when you're they're on your website. Sometimes they can completely forget what they were doing and what website they were on, um, go off, do something else and actually never come back. Many potential customers are also lost forever when they decide to take more time to reconsider a purchase. So perhaps they've got some questions or they need to check with a friend about something or they might even just wait or look for a better deal. But the question is, how do you prevent this from happening? How do you turn a higher number of visits into a purchase? The marketing technique that can help you out here is called retargeting or remarketing. Now, they are slightly different, remarketing and retargeting, but the terms are also used very interchangeably. So we're just going to call it remarketing for, for today. Um, but retargeting is reaching those that have already been on your website or a competitor's site. And remarketing is reaching people via social media, email campaigns or over the phone. It's something that sounds quite difficult, but it isn't too hard to set up and it will become invaluable. Research has shown that a huge 98% of web visitors go away without leaving an email address, without contacting you, without following you on social media or buying anything from you. So a retargeting pixel places a cookie inside the visitor's browser so their information is saved in your account. So it might be on um, Google Analytics, Facebook or Twitter, for example. You serve, then serve ads to those that have been on your website before, which is what makes retargeting so successful because they've already demonstrated their interest and they've started to engage with you. Those might be banner ads on other website pages, for example. But on average, retargeting ads will show a 10 times increase in click-through rates as people can already relate to your ad because you're not a stranger anymore. So it's a really good thing to get in place alongside your other ad campaigns. Now, it's not going to be suitable for everyone to go through how to set up remarketing either within Google Ads or the Facebook Ads Manager. So this is just a quick summary so that you can understand it a little bit more. When you go into Google Ads and you set up a Google Ads tag, you then customize it for which data you want collected, depending on your business. If you have a web developer in-house, you can either email them the tag for them to add to your website or ask them to use Google Tag Manager. It might be the already tracking other campaigns or already using Google Analytics. Or of course, you can do it yourself if you know how. You then need to copy and paste the Google Ads retargeting script onto every page of your website. And it goes in a particular position. It goes between the, the head tags. Um, once that tag is set up and you also once it's been tested on top of the basic website retargeting so just showing your ad to everybody who visited your website you can also just take it up a notch as well and you, you can target by specific date ranges or list sizes specific url visits um, and much much more than that you can also create a campaign which excludes people that have visited a certain page if you want to so that just gives you a bit of a summary on, on how it works and the people that you're you're trying to essentially bring back to complete the purchase now to help you dedicate time to the marketing activities that work including remarketing you obviously need tracking so building something called utm codes is something that tracks campaign success and that's a great approach. Now, UTM, um, it stands for Urchin Tracking Module. They're, those codes are snippets of text that are added to the end of a URL to help you track where website traffic comes from if users click a link and then visit that URL. The text can be customized to match the web page um, of the URL and, it, and it's linked in order to attribute the success of that campaign to specific pieces of content. So it doesn't affect anything on the page by adding that big piece of code. It just lets your analytics program know that someone arrived through a certain source inside an overall marketing channel as part of a very specific campaign. So here's an example that I borrowed um, from a company called RWL Design. And we can see that it's tracking visitors that visited a blog post about UTM codes 
via a post on Facebook that was boosted as a paid campaign. You can see that broken down in that example that just popped up. So instead of all social media traffic being bundled into one source, it enables you to specifically track one thing. You can build them in Google Analytics with Google's campaign URL builder or in some CRM systems like HubSpot, for example. And in your analytics, you'll be able to visit the campaign section and see that dedicated tracking data in there. So now we're going to move on to some real local examples of you know, digital adoption and digital successes. And the first one that I'm going to talk about is um, an organization called Leave No Trace. Leave No Trace is a global movement that educates and empowers people to reduce waste and care for their environment. With many visitors arriving into Brighton by train, the Brighton Community Group saw an opportunity to raise awareness as soon as tourists and residents stepped foot on the station floor. The team were keen to come up with an action plan that was environmentally friendly and would not create additional waste. So they turned to technology and they got some pro bono help from a company in Brighton called Digital Detox. Now the idea was very simple, create a pledge that visitors could read and sign as soon as they arrived in Brighton. Provide facts and encourage visitors to take responsibility for their own actions whilst they were there. And it was all in the name of coast and environment protection. So the pledge is accessible on smartphones via a QR code, which is available at Brighton train station. At the station, there are also three Android tablets. I don't know if they're still there, but they were during the, the height of the campaign. Um, they were on loan from a place called Tech Take Back. And it meant that the Brighton pledge was made accessible for everyone. They've also made circular and co-reusable cups available for sale alongside a small donation to the Leave No Trace Brighton Campaign Fund. And those cups can be purchased from Brighton sta Station, train station, and the, um, the Leave No Trace online not-for-profit shop. So pledges commit to collecting three pieces of rubbish and disposing of them responsibly each time they visit the beach. And you can see the pledge on the screen there and the three sections that go with it. They're also encouraged to share photos of themselves doing this on social media with a tag. So they tag Leave No Trace Brighton. And that's created a fantastic community of environmentally conscious people who are proud to be doing their bit to protect the beautiful Brighton seaside. So in eight months, the social tagging actually proved that nearly 9,000, so it was 8,903 pieces of, bright, of beach rubbish on Brighton that had been cleared um, due to the campaign. There might even been more where pledges perhaps didn't tag, leave no trace or just, you know, did it anyway. Um, but it's an ex excellent example of where digital technology has contributed to environmental good. Now, the second example, I'm very, very lucky today to have Louise join us from the Artisan Bakehouse in Stenning. They are an award-winning location, and she's going to talk to you about what happened with her business during COVID, how they turned that around, and all the trials and tribulations along the way. So please welcome Louise. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thanks, Rachel, and thanks for inviting me to have a little chat with you. Um, so just a bit of background about us, uh, if you haven't heard of us. Uh, we're the Artisan Bakehouse, and uh, as Rachel said, we're based in Ashurst, just outside Stenning, just on the edge of the South Downs. Uh, we've been here just over nine and going into our 10th year of trading now. We are uh, an artisan bread making school, primarily specialising in traditional artisan bread making, and we have a range of classes that we offer. Um, we also have accommodation on site. We're a venue hire business. We do events, weddings, and um, we also historically did do pre-COVID. We used to do pop-up cafe openings as well. But our core business has really always been our um, tourism, holiday accommodation business and our bread making school. And, you know, we get lots of people uh, historically worldwide who used to come and stay and, and learn to make bread with us. Uh, 
so pre-COVID, uh, life was pretty good for us. We um, we won Sussex Best Eating Experience in 2018, and that gave our business um, a real launch pad to take it further and, and, and be more well known. Uh, we have uh, one of our tutors is a guy called Emmanuel Hajandreou, who's one of the top international bakers in the world. So he became part of our team about five years ago, and that really gave us a uh, very strong following and uh, he's been a really good ambassador for us as well. So we felt, I think, pre-COVID that we were we were quite robust really as a business. We're a small business, we're rural. And I think the biggest challenge to us as a business was the fact that we, because we're rural, we have really, really poor uh, connectivity. Um, our broadband speed, um, we've made a few adjustments, which I can sort of explain, but our broadband speed was about one megabyte download and uh, less than that for upload, uh, which uh, when we did hit COVID, we realised just uh, what a challenge that was. But before COVID, I think we felt we had uh, a strong business. We had a, a lot of forward and repeat bookings. We had a very diverse business it, we, because we have you know, our accommodation, our, our baking school, our event side of our business and the ability to sort of do pop up events and, and turn the tap on. We had lots of different income streams. So, you know, if one area was a bit quieter, we could sort of tweak the model a bit and we could adjust. And, and we felt as a business we were quite lean and, and, and quite um, just able really to adapt to anything. So, um, Life was pretty good. And then like a lot of us, COVID came along and absolutely uh, decimated us as a business. Like, you know, anybody that's here in, you know, on the call um, in hospitality, it's just been absolutely devastating. And I think, you know, we've been self-employed for over 20 years and um, it was just devastating financially and emotionally to feel just totally powerless to to manage your business and we just felt totally vulnerable because there literally was nothing we could do you know when we were told to lock down we had um hundreds of people on classes that obviously we had to re refund and postpone and then all our holiday side of the business you know people weren't able to come and stay and I think that was probably the hardest hit because we never thought as a business that people couldn't come and stay in the accommodation. And that always was a core income stream for us to really sort of keep the business afloat. So, um, yeah, like like lots of people, it was a really devastating time. Uh, and I think very quickly we realised, you know, we had to have some sort of online presence. But um, as I sort of mentioned, the biggest challenge for us was we weren't even able to do uh, little Zoom calls, we weren't even able to sort of post updates. And obviously, because everybody was locked down at home, everybody was ringing us, wanting help with how to, you know, suddenly the whole nation developed an interest in baking and bread making, which has been great. Um, but we felt we couldn't even respond to our customers. And I remember uh, we did try to do when people were struggling to get yeast, we tried to do just, um, uh, you know, like a little Facebook call to sort of uh, do a video to teach people how to do a sourdough starter and, and how to do that and it took us like three days to try and upload it so again we were just so frustrated because we felt even powerless to pivot and, and get online um, so uh, amongst other things we decided we you know we was no good just crying into um, into our bread dough so we thought we need to take some action. So we were really fortunate that we applied um, to the South Downs National Park small grant scheme and um, we were given £2,000, uh, which was a really fantastic um, boost and it gave us the impetus to really look at how we could, could uh, get online. Uh, we realised we couldn't do anything live because of our poor um, connectivity here. Um, and we just looked at really our business and how we could get it online. Obviously, we looked at like maybe a food offering. We looked at maybe uh, launching some sort of like baking equipment business. And obviously, we looked at all the margins and everything involved in that. But we really came back to, I guess, what our core business is. And we thought, well, what are we good at? Um, and that's teaching people to make bread. So we thought, well, let's get back to really what we do and try and just get that online. So um, we started off um, creating and we got the help of a really fantastic um, production company, a guy who's like ex-BBC, 
and we worked with him for a couple of months to basically film. Um, we started off with four and we did four 45, 40 minute um, masterclasses. So we looked at like our, our most popular breads, which was baguettes and a basic loaf, cinnamon buns, because uh, we were coming up to Christmas. So we thought people would like that. And focaccia, which is one of our favourites. Hope everyone's not too hungry because it's kind of lunchtime. So hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, so uh, we launched those. We spent at we're not technical people at all. Uh, you know, we're a rural hands-on business which promote people to people and like artisan products, which is all about handmade for us. So for us to try and get online was, you know, really, really challenging. Um, so if anybody's listening, thinking, oh, this is all really difficult, like we were probably the worst uh, equipped people to get online, really. Um, but we took various advice that was available. Obviously, we were just totally out of cash. You know, we had like no cash flow at all. So even to just get that small grant to help us was was brilliant. Uh, so we worked for a couple of months to get that. We did all the production work and then we spent a lot of time researching uh, the various platforms and how to actually stream the courses and how to um, really just make sure that the content was safe, that they couldn't be copied. That was like the biggest challenge. Uh, so we launched four just before Christmas so that we could sort of promote it to like the Christmas market. I think that was about November time. We, we got that up and running and and it was a fantastic success within weeks we covered like the grant investment that we've been given um and people were buying gift vouchers for people and obviously just buying the classes direct uh, for themselves because obviously it was a great time as well because people were locked down so they were you know able to do that at home um and we really did that primarily just through our database just through like social media um and yeah it went quite well and we also set up a facebook a private exclusive facebook baking club where we said if you've been on our course before one of our face-to-face -face workshops or if you did an online class you could join the um exclusive club which meant that we could give people feedback and it's just been fantastic because people have like posted what they were making and then we could help them and give them other tips and so that went well so I think after that, like we had four and then people even started saying to us, oh, what else can you do? What else can I learn? Um, so we then spotted that there was another grant available through the um, SME Restart and Recovery to Kickstart Tourism. So we applied to them and we got £5,000, which was fantastic. Um, and that enabled us to go on and now we've got we've produced another seven classes so now we've got a really strong portfolio of 11 classes um so to make you feel more hungry we've got like pitters and croissants and hot cross buns uh, brioche pizzas sourdough so we've got a really comprehensive range now which has been fantastic and then we launched those in time for easter with the hot cross bun one um last april and um yeah, that we've we've had sort of ups and downs. And if I'm really honest, um, we've kind of now it, we have kind of put it down a little bit. But the great thing, only because we've just been so since April, when we were able to open up again, we've just had a backlog of about 700 people. So we've been working really hard to get that back on track. And obviously, fortunately, uh, you know, we've had a strong summer. Uh, with people coming to stay so we've had to sort of you know keep all our resources on on looking after face-to-face -face customers but I think for us the most uh, fantastic thing really I guess with going online and, and seeing the benefits of digital is that we never would have done this and it's been the big positive for us coming out of Covid because what it has done it's given um, another strong income stream to our business and it's a passive income because now we've actually put this into place you know some days we get up in the morning and we've made half a dozen sales and we don't actually do anything because it's all digital now so somebody buys it buys the product and they can then watch that class over and over again whenever they want to so that's been um you know it's fantastic and I think even you know with uh, you know the current news about possibly restrictions again that 
it's, we're not feeling quite so uneasy because we think, well, OK, at least we have got another product and another revenue stream to our business now. And we can just we know that it needs a lot more work in terms of getting people to know that these products exist. Um, we have um, and we know we really need, you know, we need the help of some of the suggestions you've made today to sort of really get it out there and have a really robust marketing plan for it. But already. Um, We've seen some great successes because we're, we've sold products to people now in America and Mexico and we've got a lady in Japan that's bought quite a few classes. And I, if I'm totally honest, it's an area we've got to work on because we don't know how we found these people, but they found us. So and then they're talking about, oh, we want to come and stay with you, which was always you know, the dream, really, if we could create this and it could have a wider appeal and bring people to the South Downs and bring people to us in person as well. So it's just been fantastic. Um, we've just also, which has been really exciting, we have partnered up with Lakeland and um, we actually um, got our production guy to take one of our 45 minute classes and reduce it to a five minute class. And Lakeland have put it onto their YouTube channel. Um, and already, I think I looked yesterday and within like a couple of weeks, we've got about 450 hits from that. And I've been trying to track what sales we're getting from that. So um, that, that's been great, too, because they've got obviously, I think, about over 30,000 followers on their YouTube. Um, so, yeah, so that's been good. They've asked us if we'll do another three, but we're just a little bit cautious at the moment because we don't want to dilute our product so that people end up just watching Lakeland's YouTube for a five minute one and not actually buying our full class. But um, that just needs a bit more work really. Um, so yeah, and we've, um, we're still desperately hoping to get through the gigabyte scheme, get us onto um, super fast broadband, but we're still being told that's another 18 months away. So at the moment we've, um, we, we got a little upgrade with 4G. Luckily we were able to get 4G. So now, um, I think on a good day we get about 12 download and eight upload but it, it's enough you know we can operate and we can get by so um so yeah so really now our next steps is to just learn from you know like Rachel and people like you that know how to get this message out there but that's we know that we've got a great product and we've had fantastic feedback from it which has been really good so we we think we've got a uh, a good portfolio now to be able to sort of take that forward and just give us you know a little bit more security really for our business so um so yeah <laughs> I think that's the, probably us I don't know if you've got any questions or that's that brilliant thank, thank you thank you, for you so much <laughs> thank you so okay. much for sharing your story and obviously it's amazing that you've come through all of those yeah. things that were thrown at you through no choice of your own yeah. and um, are really, really coming out the other side. It is brilliant to hear. Has anyone got any questions that they would like to ask? I have a right question. I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear um, just how, how you're, um, obviously, like you said, there's still kind of things that, you, that you're learning, but how has your marketing changed from, let's say, before, before you went digital? How are you kind of out, outreaching to people how and and has that kind of trend how is that transformed now how is that um what's the comparison before and after in terms of how you're marketing or is it similar or is it uh yeah i think i think if we're honest which is always a bit dangerous for a business we've always been very much a people to people business and very mm. much our business has just traded on referrals we've we've done minimal advertising historically and we've always just been busy enough and we get a lot of repeat customers and we get a lot of people you know refer and recommend us to their friends and we've got um a, a good name locally and yeah. um, a good following which has been you know we've been obviously it's taken 10 years to build but it's it's been strong um but I think now we um I think we've got about 6,000 followers on Facebook and about Three, over 3,000 on Instagram and we do do a lot more on social media than we ever did um, we you know we do use MailChimp more I think what we're trying to do now as well is we're, we're kind of complementing the two we're almost seeing our online 
business as a separate business, um, but it does complement what we do. So for example, when like all this summer, we've been doing face-to-face -face classes, but we're saying to people, oh, and you know, by the way, we also have got an online portfolio. So if you if you're, you know, if you can't come back and do another full class, and and to be fair, you know, people pay £150 to come for the day. That's quite a big investment. So some people think, oh, I would quite like to make croissants, but I don't want to put the whole day and do a whole thing. <laughs> Last, or I don't want to come for two days over the weekend and do sourdough all weekend but oh my goodness for £25 you can teach me how to make sourdough pizza or you can teach me how to make a brioche or a croissant so they're actually we're kind of marrying the two together really so um, I think that's how it's changed that we're now seeing that we're doing follow-ups to people and because we've um, I suppose the biggest change which probably would never have got round to doing is this um, exclusive bread making club that we've set up so that and we've been quite tight on that we're getting lots of requests for people wanting to join it but we're saying you can only join it if you've been on an online class or you you've been here face to face and so people are really starting to get like a little bit of a community and they're all yeah. praising each other and then they're kind of what's been quite exciting really as a business is some days you look at the little posts people are making and you think oh my goodness this is fantastic they're doing the job for us because they're saying oh have you tried this class and have you done this one and this oh. one's a good one and we're thinking, they're, oh. they're all talking to each other yeah. probably aren't they and you can yeah. just sit back and watch it happen yeah. right? <laughs> so that's really exciting but but also like just really rewarding because the biggest thing for us we're you know we are not we're not people to sit at a computer we're not digital people but we're just about real people you know face to face and we're about hands-on showing people how to enjoy and enjoy rural living and stepping back and a bit more soulful really that's what our business is and but we're what's really rewarding is seeing that people get so much joy out of thinking oh my goodness what I thought would take me forever to make decent bread I can build it into my life now and it's so easy and you've taught me how so that's the most rewarding thing really oh, but we know we've got to use digital to help us do that yeah. <laughs> well, you've made a start it's all good <laughs> Andrew what would you like to ask well, it, well, it's really interesting, actually. So, so you mentioned some of the specific things that that you kind of evolved with and did, <clears throat> like you know the videos and the the, the bread making club. But um, I think we've seen across Coast to Capital that there's been an attitude change as well. Um, so we've seen the businesses that have been successful have, have done this thing called pivoting, but it's as much about uh, a positive attitude and a way of looking at the business as anything else. But so, have you, you got any messages for other businesses? As to, as to how your change of outlook has made a difference to, to the way you've been successful? Um, oh, I don't know, that's a tough one. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I think we're by nature, and I think anybody here that's self-employed, I think entrepreneurs generally are, you know, resilient and um, positive people you know because there's no one to cover your back you know I worked in corporate life for over 20 years and without sounding arrogant this has been the hardest challenge in like in a in a 40-year career I've had you know um because you just realize if it you were going to go under if it wasn't for you and I don't mind admitting we had you know we had some really tough times where we you know were you know even my husband is sort of crying you know thinking this we've lost the whole lot we've got to sell up you know something you'd work for for like 20 odd years and you just see it just absolutely collapsing and what was really hard was you know people ringing up saying getting really shirty with you saying you know I need my money back and you can totally understand that but when you're thinking you know we thought we had a good cash flow and a good resilience but when suddenly you haven't our priority was to pay our staff and um be as honorable as we could but uh yeah it was difficult but I suppose I don't know how to say you you just have to think well okay you've got two choices you've got to dig in your boots and and uh make it happen really and and I think what what did keep us going which um probably I don't know might sound a bit soft but was our customers genuinely we had so many lovely customers ring us and say 
you know, oh my goodness, you can't go under, we'll crowdfund for you, we'll do anything. Oh, and we had customers excellent. saying to us, like, we'll come and do your garden, because we'll, we had to obviously bin off the gardeners and cut back any costs we could to just keep afloat, really. And obviously, you know, the government came good in the end, but the first three months when you still had, you know, tens of thousands of pounds worth of refunds going out and, you know, still having to pay staff and furlough them and the furlough money didn't come through for a long time. So, you know, that was a really tough time. And and just even, wow, anybody that's on the call who had to deal with it, just trying to absorb all the led, all the change in information. There was just so much information hitting you. So it was just really tough, really. But I guess, I guess, like anyone who's self-employed, you either just throw the towel in or you have to think, come on, there's a way out of this. And um, yeah. we just thought, yeah, we've got to, you know, we're not going to give up. We just thought our customers like what we do and they like coming here. And we've always felt really grateful and honoured to just be the guardians of, of, you know, the bakehouse. And we don't want to let it go because if you cut us in half, it would say the bakehouse. So we just thought, <laughs> no, we can't, we can't let it go under really. And I think I suppose anybody who's built a business from nothing, which we had, you know, to like let 10 years just fall away, we just, we weren't going to give it up really, I suppose. So um, perseverance, yeah. Andrew, yeah. And, uh, just, and keeping that passion alive as well. Yeah, you know. and I think as well, not being, I suppose one tip would be, don't be afraid to ask for help because mm. it's not, we've never, in all the years we've traded, applied for any grants or any, and we're looking back, we probably could have because we're a rural business, but we've always thought I was an ex-bank manager and and so I had a background in like finance and um, it's never been something that we felt we'd go begging for money, but when time for the chips are down, you're just like, we've got to get all the help we can get really. So, and also just the expertise, you know, the, we, um, uh, I think you know the council were very good in like keeping us updated on what help was available and um, yeah I listened into different um, you know forums on just keep keeping your morale up really and I and I remember there was a guy who runs a water sport business and um, I think a walking business on the South Downs and he was on a call one day and I remember I just came off the call and cried but I thought oh my goodness like you feel just like we do so we're not we're not alone everyone was having a tough time like he was I think he'd been some sort of um army um rescue guy in the SAS or something and he was you know he was a tough guy and he was saying this has been my hardest challenge to see all my business collapse and mm -hmm. and so you suddenly thought oh we're not we're not alone really um yeah. there was a lot of help and um you know as I said we are you know, we, well, now we wouldn't call ourselves experts, even though we've got this online. We, you know, it, we're just sort of dabbling with it, really. But it's kind of worked what we've done so far. But, um, you know, we know we need to take advice of other digital experts to help us sort of take it forward. Mm. Yeah, I suppose don't be afraid to ask for help, really, because you're never too old to learn. And if you don't, yeah, and I think never too when you know that. Right. Actually, everyone around you is taking advantage of, of the support, financial or otherwise, on offer. Yeah. Why shouldn't you? You know, it, it's yeah. there for, for everyone. So, thank yeah. you so much. That's, That's right. Brilliant. You. Um, you know, we're all, we're all really feeling for you now. We're all, we're all oh. glad that you've survived this, this thank terrible you. time. Thank you. Um, I will just go through the last few slides, and then if we've still got a couple of minutes and you, and you want to have a chat further um, with Louise, then obviously you, you, you can totally sure. fine. So I um, just want to make you aware of Experience West Sussex. Um, they couldn't make it on the call today, but they are the county's destination management organisation. They have got lots of free resources. Um, where they also do webinars and workshops that you can go and attend if you are a visitor economy business. So do have a look at their website and sign up to their, their newsletter as well to get those updates on what is available to you um, as a business in, in that sector. They're really, really lovely people and I'm sure they'll be able to help if you've got anything that you need. And I have funding on offer is, um, there's a few things. So we've got the business hot house, which is par partly, partially, I should say, matched funding. Um, low case, which is all to do with being more low carbon and also rise as well, which is um, about innovation and providing funding around that. 
Just to recap on the digital champion support, you're all eligible to get eight hours of support. A few of us are here today, but do get in contact with Coast to Capital if you would like to take advantage of that and they will assign you someone to work with you for those eight hours on whatever your priorities might be around digital adoption. That's the end of um, our session today officially. And I just want to say that the next series Systems and Productivity by FreedomWorks. They're all online and available to book your space now. Again, they're still free. They're probably on, not on um, Zoom. I think they might be held on, on the other platform, which name escapes me temporarily. Um, but they're um, on accounting systems and HR and stock inventory and things like that. So do have a look at the list and, and just look on to any that you would like. But that's it from us today. I just want, if you can take a second, to pretend the poll is there <laughs> and put in the chat whether we have raised your confidence today in marketing within this sector, that would be amazing. So that would be not at all confident, somewhat confident or confident. Thank you very much. And um, if you I want to, I managed to get the actual poll up. <laughs> I think the poll is right there. I think I managed it. <laughs> oh, it's working, is yeah, it? Yeah, I think so. I see it on my screen. So I, I can't. I, I, if, does it, does it, does it it's see? there. It's there. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. It's obviously being selective today. <laughs> cool. Let me That's good. Thank you. And yeah, if you want to hang around for a minute, you're welcome. If not, I uh, would we'll just say thank you again to Louise. Thank you to Ollie for your section as well. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, everyone. And don't forget, there is one more. Um, the final session of ours is uh, next Tuesday. It's a Q&A session. It's a big session where you can ask questions on this whole series. So that if you have some real, uh, still have some questions that you're desperate for answers on, or, or, or maybe you've been waiting specifically, that's that would be a great session where there'll be a whole panel of us it's, on there. It's going to be a marketing <laughs> blankety blank style panel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> panel that's going to work yet? But she said to dress up as a pumpkin. This is, this just is so my you know. plan. <laughs> we'll so be, be careful, there. panelists. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, excellent. That was a um, that was a brilliant case study. I, I I love that. That was that was that was you know inspiring. Really, of like the power of digital and you know how you how you just kind of rolled your sleeves up and went, right. We're going to get on and do this, and it's you know it's transformed your business. So you know, thank you, thank you for attending the session. Cool. Yeah, I I, I want to say as well that that was a fantastic um, case that, uh, and and I've I've even I was thinking you know the next thing for you is uh, rolling it out of colleges, <laughs> that'll be uh, <laughs> yeah. you know your next uh, big thing. So um, I could see it being like you know going uh, Sussex, Surrey wise, you know before you know it. Yeah. We'll be looking back at this uh, seminar thinking, oh, yeah, I remember when we when we watched this and where you'll be next year. So anyway, sorry, I'll shut up now. Oh, <laughs> no. oh, if you want us to give you all a discount code to have a look, you can we'll give you one. <laughs> oh, I wasn't, I wasn't yes, after please. a discount code, I was just saying. Can, I was you me, can you send us some of those pizza things once a week? <laughs> Tell you what, if you'd like to do Great that, boom. send me the code after and I'll put it in the follow up email. <laughs> to be honest, as soon as Rachel told, showed me that, that, that you were coming on to talk about it, I went on the website. I was like, I'm obviously going to be booking this for a weekend away. Now, now was... We can have yeah, those things lovely. in our morning sprint, Sully. Great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A bit oh. Okay, yeah. sure. I'll do one for the, um, well, the cottages or the shepherd's hut or if oh, you want. Brilliant. You. That'd be amazing. Yeah, no worries. Well, yeah, because the. Everyone needs a bit of a help just now as well, don't they? Right. Oh, yeah. oh, thank You're you. so kind. Oh, all right, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you, everyone. Oh, thanks, everyone. Bye. Look forward to seeing you on the next Bye. one. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Oh, I've just realised. Oh. Good work. That was great, guys. Well done. Clap, clap. That case study.